I invited everybody to vote what to, what to talk about, and the votes came in, so I'm going to talk about the bulk limit this time. And uh, this lecture is going to be in nature slightly different from the previous two, because we're not going to start from, from uh, random matrices, okay? but, but rather we're going to go from top down. So, so I'm going to talk about these operators first, and I'm going to tell you roughly how you get to them. Okay? There's going to be a little bit more storytelling than, than before. So, so it, uh, but I'll try, I'll try still to give you some math, okay, at least. So, <laughs> so I think the first thing uh, that I have to talk about is the hyperbolic plane. And that's just because, uh, you know, I, I gave you all this uh, nice story about, about how, uh, you know, you, you care about geometry and random matrices, and then people were complaining that the only geometry they got was the geometry of the line. So, so uh, let's, let's, let's talk about the hyperbolic plane, kind of unrelated to everything else. Um, okay, so, 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 you, so, so you know, right, that the hyperbolic uh, plane has a, has a long story, it, uh, starting with the parallel postulates of Euclid, which everybody tried to prove, and nobody could. In fact, uh, Aquinas, uh, you probably know, said that even God couldn't do such a thing, that the sum of the degrees of a triangle is not 180 degrees. Uh, and then until, uh, you know, and it went all the way until the 1800s, where, where, you know, three people independently found this geometry where this thing doesn't hold. So this is Gauss, uh, uh, Lobachevsky, and Boyai. Uh, and this is the hyperbolic plane. So, as you know, there are two nice models. I mean, there are several nice models, but the ones I'm going to talk about are, are the Poincaré half-plane model and the Poincaré disk model. Um, and, you know, this is a, the Poincaré disk model. Uh, this is, you know, the, 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 the hyperbolic plane is, just think of it as a manifold, uh, where, you know, if you have something here, at, this at, at length epsilon in the Euclidean plane at distance r, then the length here is, is epsilon times 1 minus r squared. Okay? So that's the, this is a disk of radius 1. So, so the lengths, of course, so things that are short here are much longer as you get to the boundary. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and the same thing is true. So here, here, if the height is y, then the length element is 1 over y. Okay? So as you get to the, the boundary, things get longer. Uh, and um, I don't know, the, the, you know, the standard thing that you, you probably have seen is, is these Whitney squares here, which is a nice way to think about the hyperbolic plane. So if you have squares here and you have you know, squares of half the size, and then you have here a quarter of the size and so on. So um, can then, then, then all of these squares are actually um, isomorphic. So, so there is a, in fact, this, this is a, this is a, trans this is a um, transitive lattice. So if you have pick any point and at the other point, there's an automorphism of the hyperbolic plane that takes one to the other and, and keeps, keeps this, this uh, square structure. So, so this sort of tells you, for example, that, that if you have a point here, say I in the hyperbolic plane, then if you have something which is of this and epsilon uh, from, from the boundary, then its distance from I is about log epsilon. Just, you can just see it from the squares, for example. Okay. So this distance here, if this is Euclidean distance epsilon, then this is the hyperbolic distance from I is about log epsilon. In fact, it's exactly log epsilon. Uh, so this one, this distance here, dh is log epsilon. Okay. Um, the other things that you, that you know is that, is that, is that the... Um, you know, there are rotations and translation of all kinds of uh, is isom isometries of the hyperbolic plane, and they all correspond to Möbius transformations, so linear fractional transformations that fix, of course, the corresponding object, uh, so, so the disk or the, or the line. Okay? Uh, and those form uh, various groups. You know, this one is SO2R, and this one is SU11. So there's this things of, of, <coughs> of, of, of linear fractional transformations. Um, so there is also a natural notion of boundary, which is kind of obvious, right? So, so, so if this is the hyperbolic plane, and this is the boundary. You know what it means to converge to a boundary point. So this, this model, the boundary is completely obvious. Sorry, can I just ask? Yes? You said it's 
long epsilon. But if epsilon is small, then this is, then this is negative. Uh, OK. OK, yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, so yeah, minus log epsilon is the distance. So, um, OK, so, so let's see what's happening here. So um, there is also an interesting thing. So, 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 so suppose that there is a sun uh, you know, in, in, in a hyperbolic planar world. Okay? So, so what does the sun do? The sun goes, let's say, around the horizon at constant speed. Okay? So, so that's, you know, that's days and nights, I don't know, whatever you, li you like. Then, then, then you know, there is this strange thing that, that actually th th you have different times depending on where you are. Okay, so, so for example, if, you, if, you're, if you're here, you see the angle of the sun changing differently than if you are, than if you are here. Okay. And this is, this is, again, different from Euc the Euclidean setting. Okay. So in other words, there is another thing you can do, and this is what we're going to do, so I'll tell you, which is that you, you have a boundary point, and we're interested in, so let's say you have a boundary point, you're interested in rotating the boundary point about some center of rotation at some speed. Okay. So if this center is actually the center of the disk, then this is just uh, the trivial rotation. Okay. okay, but if the center is somewhere else, then you can figure out what this rotation is by conjugating it, sending it to the center, doing the trivial rotation, and then sending it back by this Mobius transformation. And, 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 and you know, uh, these, these, uh, these uh, Mobius transformations, they leave Brownian motion, for example, invariant up to time change. Okay, so, so uh, so, that, so this ha gives you a way of understanding how fast the rotation goes. Okay? Um, and, 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 you know, uh, what happened is that before this changing of center, you covered uh, unit harmonic measure in unit time, okay, for brain emotion. And so, so, you know, harmonic measure is just the heating measure on the boundary. And, and that's going to be true also if, you, if, you're, if you're rotating from somewhere else, but the harmonic measure is different. Okay, so, so in fact, the actual speed is going to be the inverse of the harmonic measure. Okay, so the Euclidean speed is going to be the inverse of the harmonic measure. So if you're close to here, it goes slower. If you rotate from here, then it goes much faster. Okay? So that's just, that's just the, the, uh, the geometry. Okay, so, so um, that's hyperbolic geometry. And, and I'm going to talk about an object called hyperbolic carousel, which we introduced with Benedek Valko in, I think it's 2007. Um, so so it's, it's just uh, something very simple. So you have, okay, so you have a point, have, have, a, have, a, have, a po <coughs> have a point in the hyperbolic, have a path in the hyperbolic plane, okay, which we call Bt. So this is a path. It doesn't have to be continuous. I'll still call it a path. Okay. Um, and then you have a, have, a, have a point on the boundary, which you call, uh, I don't know, gamma t. Okay. And, and, and you do the following operation. Uh, you, know, you, you don't know. I'll tell you later why, but please let, let me tell you what, what you do. So you rotate this point ga gamma t with center bt at speed lambda, okay? So I write this down. Okay? So, so if, you, if you're in this Poincaré this model, I can, and, and so you write everything in the Poincaré coordinates, and you can write an ODE, so let me, let me write that. So gamma prime uh, of t is lambda times, you have to put this harmonic measure, so the way it looks like is, is the distance between gamma and, and uh, bt, okay, squared, and it's divided by 1 minus b squared. Okay, so uh, that's, that's, the, that's the ODE, okay, that satisfies me. Hmm? No, this is Euclidean distance. Yeah. But, but it's important. So this is written in Euclidean coordinates, but this whole thing is defined intrinsically. Okay, we, we don't care about don't care about what's going on. Okay. 
so 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 then uh, using okay so then I'm going to define another point on the boundary okay so uh, let, let let's let's call this u0 and u1 okay and let's say that t is so t is in the interval 0 1 so you run so you run let's think them till time 1 time 1 and 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 you're going to define n lambda so it's a function of lambda okay which is just the number of times you pass u1 okay so so u by u i mean gamma 1 gamma of t okay so you do this rotation around your path you may go around several times and you just count how many times you have passed this point u1 okay. so what is it so it's a it's some kind of increasing function right so it's step function integer value step function in any direction it's not algebraic you can press in one sense or the other. You can press one. This one is always going in the same direction. So there is no, no issue like that. Okay, it's, it's increasing, right? It's the well, you first pick lambda, and, and you rotate at speed lambda. Lambda doesn't depend on time. Okay? Uh, but lambda can also be negative. So you can, you can extend this to the negative direction as well. Okay? Something like this, the same way. OK? So, let's be the we define that. So, gamma, gamma is a path, is given to you, it's a parameter. Okay. So, gamma prime t is directed or what does it define? Oh, sorry, b is a path, so gamma is defined for you. So, it's gamma that depends on lambda, okay, and t. Let's put, put t here also. So, that, that's in this gamma prime or gamma? Yeah. Gamma prime. Okay. So, the change in gamma. Uh, so how much this uh, this angle changes is lambda times this speed factor, which de just depends on, which is the inverse harmonic measure. And so it's a, it's a definition for gamma prime? Yes. Gamma, this is the derivative of gamma, so this is an OD. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you solve the OD. I, you know, I just wrote what I told you in words in math. Okay, <laughs> that's all. <laughs> there is no... <coughs> okay, so, so what you get here is you have this triple, so which is b u0 u1 right this is a path these are two points on the boundary and to this triple you associate this n lambda which is a counting function for some point process from some set of points okay so, so there are point where you jump you have points right okay so so or, or or so which is the same right so this is the same as some lambda which is a set of points right Okay, so this is called a hyperbolic carousel. Okay. You have a path, two points on the boundary, it gives you a bunch of points. So, sorry, so this is the, um, can the enumerator the Euclidean distance or the... This is, this is, this is all in Euclidean coordinates, Poincaré this coordinates. Okay. Okay. Uh, but, 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 you know, it's written here so that it's very explicit, but 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 as you see, you know, the, the, the explanation shows you that this is intrinsic. It doesn't you can define it anywhere. It doesn't matter, right? Do it in the half line if you want. Actually, we're gonna do it in the half line. <sighs> okay, so I'm gonna give you various examples of this. Okay, so so this is uh, this is. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna be lots of examples. But first, let me try to li write this in terms of automorphisms okay because because of course the nice way the really nice way to handle it is in terms of automorphisms of uh, of the of the hyperbolic plane and so let's let's go into uh, the half plane model like this so this is the Poincaré half plane okay so so we're going to write b uh, b of t in this in this world Okay, so it's the upper half plane. Um, we're going to write it as x t, x t plus i y t. Okay. So you get from here to there by here to there by a Cayley transform. Okay. So it's another LFT that takes the so to this to the to the half plane. Um, so so um, so let's uh, let's see how we can write this in terms of so in terms of uh, 
uh, matrices. So, so we're going to take the boundary point gamma, we associate it to some, some function f of t, which, which is going to be uh, actually a vector. So f1 of t, f2 of t. OK? Uh, so, so, so it's going to be a two vector. Because that's, that's the way you represent the Möbius transformations, right, in terms of matrices. The points in the, di points in the complex plane are going to be two vectors. Uh, they correspond to the ratio. So this corresponds to f1 over f2 in, in the complex plane. But this is in the boundary, so actually, actually this happens to be actually real. Okay? Because this is a boundary point, and the boundary here is exactly the real line. So, so that makes things a little bit nicer. Okay? Uh, <coughs> So this is gamma, uh, and 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 so let let me let me see what, wh how how you make this into a rotation. So so let's uh, just give you one uh, simple thing. So if you look at the solution f prime, uh, the the or the f prime is one half uh, zero one minus one zero f. Okay. So just let's look at this ODE. So what this does, uh, and I'm not going to go into the details of this, so let's check. So let's actually do an exercise. Okay. This ODE is the rotation uh, at speed 1 about the point i. Okay, so there is the point i in the upper half plane, and this exactly corresponds to rotation at speed 1 about that. You could simply de deduce this by writing the rotation in the Poincaré disk model and just conjugating, conjugating it to the half plane. That's good, good so far. Okay, so that's that's the rotation. Um, now, yes. So in the first example, it was a rotation um, with center B. Yes. Here. It's center I. So for. So we're center i. Yeah, we're, just, we're getting there. We're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> okay, yeah, this is not. This is just. An, this is. This has nothing. This is just an exercise. Okay. <laughs> you mean this is just Euclidean rotation across the earth? No, not Euclidean rotation. This is the hyperbolic rotation at speed one about i. Okay. It corresponds to the Euclidean rotation. It's the same as the Euclidean rotation in the in the Poincaré model, but in the half plane it's not. Right. In the half plane, you you these things move at Cauchy speed basically, or inverse Cauchy speed. So, so you just write the Cauchy density and the inverse of that, because that's the harmonic measure. So the inverse of that will be the speed. So things that are far away from I will move very fast on the boundary and so on. Is it true that the location, if I start from the real line, so will be stay on the real line? Yes, because the boundary is kept in these rotations always. And if you, and if you start somewhere else, you're going you're gonna to go in a circle. Because circles are actually also circles in the hyperbolic plane. But the center is not go the Euclidean center is not I. This is a circle. Okay. Um, okay. So, so now let's introduce this matrix-valued function. Okay, which is actually very simple. So it's one minus x of t, zero y of t. Okay. So that's just we just made an affine matrix. Okay. Out of out of uh, out of x out of x and y. So. So this has the property that if I take x, uh, you think of this as a Möbius transformation, and apply it to the point with x plus i y. Okay, so x plus i y. Just I suppress the t one. Okay, so this vector. Uh, then, then, then you get. So, so let me put a dot here so that this is like a. You know, this is matrix multiplication, but it also corresponds to the hyperbolic action. Then you get, I think, you know, some constant times i1. Okay? So it takes the point x, x plus i, y to the point i. Okay? In h. Okay, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an action on, on the hyperbolic plane. Okay, so. So why is this good? Because this gives you now, this will allow you to, to, to write, this, uh, write the, the, the evolution of gamma. So what is going to be the evolution of gamma? It's not going to be the evolution of f, right? So it's going to be f prime is equal to 
so let me put the lambda because we, we, we let's just uh, there's this over two because of that one half. You put this matrix zero one minus one zero, and you have to conjugate it by x, okay? Because x x will take this point to i, and if you conjugate it by x, then then the rotation is gonna be exactly about that point and not 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 about i. So you just put here x inverse x, okay? Um, f, okay? So, so this is uh, this is what this is what another equation for the same thing except in now it's matrices. Excuse me. So x x inverse x. Uh, I think it's well. I ho hope not. I think it's this. X brings the uh, x plus x to i. Uh, it's possible. Okay. Yeah, let's see. Maybe, maybe it's this. Okay, so so uh, let me let me double check what I have in my notes. <laughs> I, I, I wrote I wrote it like this. Yeah. Oh, okay. So now here is here is uh, here is one thing. So if you look at this matrix, okay, this matrix you can write as follows, just because of the properties of of of. Uh, uh, of two by two matrices of this matrix X, you can write it as X transpose X over the determinant of X, which is by the way Y. So I'm just going to write it so that it's it's this is just Y, <laughs> okay? Times the matrix zero one minus one zero, okay? Just some identity. Check it out, <laughs> okay? And I c I'm going to call this matrix R. Okay. So now I got the following equation. Again, let me write it again. So f prime is equal to lambda lambda times r over two uh, zero one minus one zero f. Okay. And this r is 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 non-negative definite. In fact, positive definite in our case. Okay, so we did this computation, and we got to a place which is actually very nice um, because this object that you see here is called a canonical system. Okay. So that is that is exactly what a canonical system is. So let me tell you what canonical system so uh, is. So, so this is a this is uh, um, you know, something that comes from scattering theory, uh, and, and uh, um, basically there's a, there's a history of, of, of understanding various generalizations of scattering theory. In some sense, this is, this is a, a continuous analog of a tridiagonal matrix, so that's, that's one, one thing I could say. Okay. Uh, it doesn't look like it, but, but in fact, you can put tridiagonal matrices into this form. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is somehow the nicest generalization that there is. Okay? And the theory of these things was worked out by De Branche. Okay, in, in this beautiful book uh, in the 60s, 60s, right? It's called Hilbert Spaces of Analytic Functions. Okay, so, so he's the one who kind of unified this theory, the theory of such, such objects. Uh, and, 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 and I'm not going to tell you the details of this, but, but, but the one thing that's uh, important is that, so this book is actually perfect. So, so there, there are things of the branch that are not perfect, but this one is, is, is almost perfect. It's not easy to read. Uh, it's, it, the language is very simple, but, it, but almost everything is done in exercises, so that's one, one problem. <laughs> Uh, and actually, if you want to learn about canonical systems, there is a beautiful, very recent re review by Romanov, which is which is sort of uh, basically takes the branches book and, and, and explains it to 
to, to people who have finite patience. So, um, so, so, so this is a <laughs> this is a canonical system, and um, what what did what did De Branche uh, use a canonical system for? He basically tried to use it to to prove the Riemann hypothesis. Okay, but this was later, <laughs> after after this theory was completely uh, developed. So basically, he he has some papers where he says, well, you can you can set up such a canonical system. To this canonical system, you can associate um, eigenvalues. I'll tell you in a second how. And and you can you can set this up in a way that the eigenvalues are exactly the uh, you know the non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function. Transform to the real line. Okay, so so that didn't work, at least. Uh, but then, of course, you know wh what's the random analogy of the zeros of the zeta function? Well, that's that's random matrix eigenvalue, uh, yeah, right? To the, the bulk limit of of uh, of the uh, GUE. Right? So so even though it's nobody knows if you can put the Riemann zeta zeros here. <laughs> you may ask if you can put the GUE in here in this kind of setup. Okay, and the ans answer is yes, and that's what I'm going to talk about. How? Okay. So first of all, uh, why is this? Why is this? Uh, why does this have to do with op an operator? Um, um, well, let me see if I get this right. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe. Maybe the R over two goes here. Um, sorry, I, I think. The yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. So, yes. Yeah, so this is how it goes. So. So this is a canonical system, and um, it, it 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 contains many things. Again, uh, I'll show you how it contains uh, unitary matrices in some sense. Uh, it also contains tridiagonal matrices. As I, as I said, it contains Schrodinger operators with potential. You can put them in this form. And then it contains the Dirac operators. And the Dirac operators are the case when this R is invertible. Okay, so it's always non-negative definite. It may have zero eigenvalues. But if it has, if it has non-zero eigenvalues, then, then, then it's invertible. And then I can put this in the form. So let's see what do I do. So, so, so take... Uh, the inverse of this matrix, which is 0, minus 1, 1, 0, right? And then you take the inverse of, of R over 2, so you get 2 R inverse, okay? And, and, and I write del x, or del t, okay? F equals to lambda f, okay? This is, this is, this is what I got from here. So what is this? So this we can call tau. This is an operator. And this is the eigenvalue equation of the operator. <coughs> right? It says I take some function f, I apply to it some operator, and I get, get f back to get back lambda times f. Okay, so, so what we have produced is is given this hyperbolic carousel, we have produced an operator which 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 has uh, eigenvalues of that, and this is actually the way that his, uh, this was done historically. So we, we came up with this carousel you know, ten years ago, and then we found they can do it as an operator much much later. So so, but and here is here is how you do it. It's pretty simple, right? So so again, what kind of operator is this, right? You take a vector valued function. 0, 1, so the interval 0, 1, 2. You may want to leave this open here. Uh, I'll tell you why. To r squared. Okay. And um, uh, there has to be some boundary conditions which correspond to that starting and ending points there. Okay, so it, it tells you that f0 is parallel to some vector. Maybe u0, 1 or something, and, and f1 is parallel to u1, 1. So those are the boundary conditions. F, F, uh, these are f at time 0 and f at time 1, right? They're, they're vectors. Um, and, and then 
you apply it, it, it differentiate f and you apply this matrix to, to that vector valued function f, you get the new vector valued function and you check whether it's equal to lambda f. And this again is this R is as a parameter t there. So okay, so, so we have some kind of identification of of uh, you know of, of pass here, you get a point process, you get an operator. So do you assume that f is continuous or? Um, well, yeah, it should be differentiable. Okay, and the one is delimited. Excuse me? Because f is not defined at once. Yeah, so at one, uh, there's some technical issues. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll probably not tell you about those. <laughs> yes? Not the time. So you say it's from 0 to 1, but in this picture of n lambda, but where's the time there in the, the upper board? The time there is. In lambda, the, in the, uh, what you draw on the left, uh, right side. The upper board. Right. So, so, so in n lambda, the time is gone. So you got the n lambda uh, at the fixed lambda by running this whole process through the entire time. Okay. So when you run this process, you get a number of how many times you have passed, and that will be your n lambda for that lambda. And if you want to compute it for another lambda, you do it again with a larger lambda. But this is now a time to infinity or time to. Yeah. That that uh, for you can use it with it for any lambda. So this is this is defined in the Hourier line. Now here you fix the time and you change the lambda, you vary lambda, whereas before you used to fix lambda and vary the times of uh, Well, uh, you, ca you can do, you know, so, so, so let, okay, let's, let's clarify this. So, um, so, you know, so, so how, do you ch how do you check whether f, whether lambda is an eigenvalue? Right? So what you can do is you can just start f with this, this initial condition and solve this ODE, right? This is an o if it's an ODE if you write it like that. And then you see what happens with this ODE. Well, it's this thing f is going to go around the boundary of the hyperbolic plane. And if it ends up at u0, at u1, okay, then you're happy. That means I have an eigenvalue. So that's, that's what you can see from here. But in fact, uh, there is an oscillation theory, a storm level theory, which says that you can say actually more. And the more that you can say is exactly what I put up there, which is exactly that the number of times you have passed in one rotation will tell you how many eigenvalues there are that are less than, that are between zero and your lambda. Okay? And it's kind of obvious if you think about it. Just, it's just, it just follows from continuity. It's a topology and argument that I, that I, uh, that I um, invite you to, to do. Okay? So these two lambda are <coughs> the same? Uh, these are the same lambda, yeah. So, so the eigenvalues of tau are exactly the points in, points in capital lambda. OK, so those are the, the places where n lambda jumps. Hmm? It's clear. Hmm? That's when, because you can always solve this, right? This f always solves it. We can solve this for f. And, and, and that's when the right boundary condition is satisfied. Okay. So let's let's do some examples. Okay. What if you just set, you know, R to be the identity? Okay, or, or x and y too. This is the same as say, setting x and y, x plus i y equal to i. Simply. So, so you're just rotating about the point i. Okay, so let's just let's just do what, let's just see what we what you have, right? So, so then R T inverse is just this. So, so which one should we do? Maybe, maybe this, right? So you have f one prime. Uh, is equal to uh, minus f2, right? Because, oh no, it's there. So actually plus f2. Sorry, f. Okay, I do it like that. f from prime is f2 times lambda, right? From reading the first row of this. f from prime is lambda times this thing will take you, bring you f2. And f2 prime is equal to 
minus lambda f1. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So what's the solution? So let's see. So so the derivative of cosine is minus sine. So the derivative of sine is cosine, right? So let's take S uh, f one is. We're gonna set the boundary, the conditions to work for us. So f one is sine lambda over two t. And f2 is cosine lambda over 2t. Okay. And if you set the right boundary conditions, so let's say that u0, so the left boundary condition should be, let's set it uh, 0, 1. Okay. That corresponds to u0 equal to infinity, but that's fine. And the right boundary condition you can also set 0, 1. Okay, u2, u1 equal to infinity. Um, then what, what do you get? Well, you get that eigenvalues <coughs> are lambda i, k is 2 by k. So, so, so just so, so, because that's that's when, right? That's when when you plug in one here, then you should should get uh, this one thing parallel to that. So this corresponds to the to the point process, which is zero, two pi, four pi, and so on. Right? So if you do a random shift of this process by, by 2 pi, then we'll call this process the, the sine um, infinity. OK. It's, it's rigid. You, you, you'll, see, you'll see why. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's one example. One very stupid question mm -hmm. in n lambda. So, what did you pass sec mention mean this the, uh, in the this this model model the line from u one to uh, some b t or what you mean by pass u one in n lambda? So, so you look at gamma t, it moves around the boundary, okay. right, and it it always goes in one direction. At infinity, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And u one is a point on the boundary. Yeah. I mean, uh, and you just count how many times you hit it. That's, that's it. You can write it in terms of some arg, you know, you solve the SD, you solve this uh, OD there. And uh, actually, actually, yeah, I, I, I made a mistake here. It's, I should have said, so th there's a mistake here, because this should be really e to the i gamma t. <coughs> right, so you actually write the Euclidean coordinate, and this is the angle. Okay, that, that's, that, that's, the, that's the correct. Uh, so, okay, that, 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 that explains why you're asking this question. <laughs> okay. All right, so. So, let me look at example two. Okay, and, 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 and this is unitary matrices. Or, or more generally, uh, measures supported on endpoints, so probability measures on endpoints on, on, on the unit disk, unit circle. Let's see. Okay. So, 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 so. So this story is, is an analogy of what we did in the beginning uh, of, the, uh, of these lectures, where we had endpoints on the real line, which corresponded to the spectral measure of a, of a, of a matrix, of a, of a self-adjoint 
uh, or symmetric matrix. Here, if you take the unitary matrix, UN, right, and you take a vector E, and it has a spectral measure. Okay, so U is in, let's see, the unitary group UN, then U has spectral measure. Add some vector E. Uh, and that's a general, and, and, and that's, you know, that's, um, that's a probability measure on the circle, which is supported on endpoints. Okay. So, okay, so what does this have to do with what we're doing? It has to do with the following. So if, if gamma t, uh, sorry, let's x plus i t, so the path, be constant. So we already did constant uh, at, at i. Constant at any other point is actually the same just because, just because you can conjugate this whole, same whole, whole picture to send the po point to i. But, but, but let's say that's just, just piecewise constant. So if constant has intervals, uh, k over n and k plus 1 over n, something like this. Is there a y? x plus i, y, t? Uh, x plus i, y, t. Okay, yeah. so the path, so, so we make it constant on, on the, so take the interval, divide it up here. So, so again, this is a path, right? So it's a hyperbolic plane, so it's a path that is some kind of step process. Uh, and it's, it's not continuous, it's just piecewise constant. Yeah. So, so then um, there is a theorem, which is, again, from our, uh, from our new paper, uh, um, and it's actually very simple, so, so let me, Right, so, the, so then the eigenvalues, okay, so if uh, we have, a, if, if uh, so consider the measure, okay, so what, what should be this measure? It's some measure sum of i equals 1 to n of, of q, uh, qi delta lambda i, where lambda i are in, in, in the boundary of the disk. Okay, so this is, a, this is a, that kind of measure. Um, uh, so if the increments, and I'll tell you this more precisely, of gamma, uh, sorry, of, of, of x plus i, i y, are the Verblinsky coefficients, Maybe say it, say it more precisely. Are given by the Verblinsky. So I'm going to put this here like that. I'll explain in a second. Of mu. Okay. So or, or maybe sigma. So this is the measure sigma. Um, then the eigenvalues of tau are exactly so. So okay. Let's make it. Let's write. Let me parameterize this like this. So you like e to the i lambda i. Okay. So, so lambda is real. N times lambda, I plus 2 pi z, uh, where I equals 1 to N. Okay, I think like this. Okay. 
Okay, so what does this say? Okay. So, so if I have a measure on the, disk, on, the, on the boundary of the disk, just like in the previous case, which is a probability measure, then there exists for it an operator such that the eigenvalues of that operator are almost exactly this, this point. Not exactly this, but it's their lifting. Okay, so you lift these points to the real line and you repeat them periodically. That's why the plus two pi z. Okay? And you also do it so that the average spacing will be, will be two pi. N lambda i plus two pi z? Yes, n lambda i plus two pi z. So n lambda i is just, just some number, right? And then you, and then you take all of, all of its shift. But then you range over all i, so all the eigenvalues. So you re really what you do is you take the eigenvalues, you, you lift it by the covering space, then you, and then you stretch it out by, uh, by n so that, so that the average spacing is 2 pi. Okay, that's all. Okay, so, so, I, so I told you how these two things are related, and I have to tell you what the Verblonsky coefficients are, and I have to tell you what I mean by increments. Okay. So, so the Verblonsky coefficients are uh, coefficients in the Sega recursion. So the Sega recursion is the following. You want to write, you want to figure out what the orthogonal polynomials are for this measure. Okay? So orthogonal polynomials are just the ordinary things. You want polynomials that are orthogonal or de degree, you know, the, the ith one is degree i minus one. Okay? And, and, and they're basically uniquely defined up to normalization. And they satisfy a certain recursion. Okay. This is two on the real line, if, if you have seen that. In fact, the recursion is given by this Jacobi matrix. But we didn't discuss that, but, it, but it's true. And here the recursion is not given by a matrix. It's just, it's just a two-term recursion. Okay. So it's, it's given by sort of two by two matrices. Okay. And in those matrices, there is only one number. Every matrix has one number. It's called alpha. That alpha is the Verblonsky coefficient. So it's a complex number, so 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 the Verblonsky coefficients are. Let's let's look at. Um, so you know the segregate recursion is really a beautiful story, but I don't have time to say it in now form completely. But you have alpha zero, alpha n minus two. These are in in the interior of disk, in the interior of the disk, and then you have an alpha n minus one, which is in in the boundary of the disk. Uh, boundary of the disk, and 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 that's what that's what these things look like. They're complex numbers of this kind. Okay, and as you can see, again, this data is two n minus one dimensional, just like just like this data, because the qi sum up to one, and there is a one to one correspondence. And you know, if you want to learn about it, uh, you know, Barry Simon has a two thousand page book. So I'm not kidding. Maybe maybe just 1,500, but it's it's long <laughs> and it's beautiful. So there's a huge huge theory about how this thing works. Um, okay, but uh, and then in the increments, you know, so the increments here will have to be understood in terms of matrix products. Okay, so so you so you multiply those matrices together, and then you see how they act on the the, the upper half plane, and th and then that's then you get the increments of the walk. So that's 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 so I, that's that's the, that's the theorem. Uh, so, so every unitary matrix has, uh, has some eigenvalue distribution uh, or a spectral measure, and you can associate to this this kind of operator. Okay, so that's example two. Yes. Okay, so example three. Okay. So here too, you, you took the same boundary conditions as before, from zero one to zero one. So the boundary condition actually is, is given by this guy. You start you start at uh, one or something, and, and then you end at this. You start at yeah, you start at one. Well, start at zero and, and you end at that one, but you have to transform it to the to the real line. So, um, okay. So example three. 
is uh, just hyperbolic Brownian motion. Okay, so you take B. Okay, so you can take BT to be hyperbolic Brownian motion. Or uh, okay, so let's write B is x plus i t, and B satisfies on the real line. So DB is is m, m b times dz, okay, and b zero is i, okay. So so this is hyperbolic Brownian motion. This is an ordinary complex Brownian motion. So real part and, and com imaginary part are independent real standard real Brownian motions. Uh, you solve this ODE. So when the imaginary part is small, you bu bus slower because because uh, in a small distances there actually mean large distances in the hyperbolic plane. So this is an this is intrinsic in the hyperbolic plane, and this thing is called hyperbolic Brownian motion. Okay. So when this is the hyperbolic Brownian motion, you set some boundary conditions. You run it to finite time, so say time one, or you can and you can put in a variance here if you want some sigma, so you can put a standard deviation. Um, then you have the following theorem. And this is uh, this is due to Krzyzewski. So it connects a little bit to Simone's talk. So if you look at uh, the random Schrodinger operator on one dimension, okay, and you put some potential here, v1, v2. Let's put the sigma, which is some standard deviation. And let's say that expectation of vi is zero and vi are iid. Uh, and you also want the variance of vi equal to one. So that sigma will gonna, uh, is going to. OK, so and it, it's, it's n by n. And let's call this, let's call this hn. So it's the one-dimensional, standard one-dimensional random Schrodinger operator. So you take this guy. Um, this, I have to write you some formula. I'd like to be precise. Right. So you pick a, so the spectrum of this is roughly from minus 2 to 2. OK, because the, so sigma is going to be small. In fact, sigma is going to go to zero. So sigma, um, should be, uh, some sigma tilde times one over root n. Okay. Okay. So, so let's say that I'm looking, I'm going to look at the spectrum of this operator at some energy level E. Okay. Which is with minus two to two. So what am I going to do? I look at Hn. I subtract E. Okay. I have to blow it up by a factor of n if I want to see a point process, because they're n eigenvalues, right? So the spacing is about 1 over n. They live in this thing. And then there is a, 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 another scaling factor rho, which is uh, just some function of E. So it's 1 over 1 minus E squared over 4. And let's say that the eigenvalues of this scaled operator, let's call this lambda n. OK? OK? So then the theorem says that lambda n um, converges. Um, to the eigenvalues of this tau, which corresponds to this Brownian motion, no? hyperbolic Brownian motion, uh, with, so let's call this limiting sigma, sigma infinity equals uh, sigma times rho. And it's almost true. Uh, there is some shift story here. So, so 
uh, you have to put here a shift which depends on n, so I call alpha n. This is just some number, and alpha n is in 0 and 2 pi for every. It's just some sequence, okay? And I can tell you exactly what that sequence is, but I don't want to know. Okay, and, and these eigenvalues of this we call the Schrodinger tau process. Schrodinger tau, which is Schrodinger process. There's a parameter, which is this variance squared. Yes? What happens if you, instead of taking constant sigma, right, you scale it? You, sc you scale it. You, take, you, you take scale it. Here. No, 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 I don't, yeah, I, I'm thinking something not homogeneous in the sense that uh, yes. you take sigma depending on the j. Right? Yes, 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 you can do that. You can yeah. do that yes. and you get the same result out of it? If you, no, so if you, if you make this decrease. Exactly, you make it decrease like one over square root of j. One over square root of j. Yes, if you do it, then you get beta ensembles. Ah, okay. then you get beta and, and, and which beta ensemble depends on actually the constant I in front of the sigma uh -huh. and where you look in the spectrum. Ah, okay. It depends on E and sigma. It depends on both things. Yeah, okay. yeah. That's in this paper. So, so the answer is in that paper. There's no, it's not, yes. Okay, so, so this is, a, so, so you have this nice thing where you have, you know, this, it's not a random matrix ensemble, although I haven't told you that, right? This could be that the Schrodinger process is some random matrix ensemble. Yeah, but it's a, non, it's a random process, okay? It's, it, it is actually, it is translation invariant by multiples of 2 pi. That's easy to check. It's not translation invariant by, by any, any number. Okay? So it's not translation invariant by, say, multiples, by 1. Okay? Uh, it sort of remembers uh, the original locations of the eigenvalue. The, the, this, this noise that you had, it still, it still remembers. I, don't, I really don't have enough time. Okay. Um, okay. And let's do example four. Uh, and now you write db. Okay. So the so the Brani, the, the, the Brani emotion um, is going to be one over um, two over root beta times root one minus t d im im b d z. Okay, so, so what is this doing? Um, so if you don't put this here, then it's just an ordinary hyperbolic Brownian motion. If you put this thing here, it just scales this. The variance is, is, is going to scale, be scaled depending on beta and time. Okay? In particular, uh, you know, the square of this is not integrable. So that means that, that then this Brownian motion is actually going to go, by time one, it's going to get to infinity. Okay, so it's running this funny time. This is actually right. We, we call this logarithmic time. There is a natural. There is a reason why this is extremely natural. So you're going to have actually a Brownian motion that that goes to infinity, and then you have to. Then the right boundary condition is a little bit uh, irrelevant. In fact, we're going to take b infinity. Infinity is the right boundary condition. Okay, and in this example, the the uh, the the eigenvalues of tau are called the sine beta process. Okay, and and again, this is a definition, if you like, for beta, uh, not one of the classical values. But when beta is one of the classical values, it's a theorem. Okay, so 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 the sine two process is just you know the sine current process is actually has the same distribution as the eigenvalues of this this particular guy. Okay, so example five is actually a continuation of example two. Uh, remember unitary matrices.
Okay. And, and this is the result of Kilip and Nanchu, who started with Amy to Edelman and Dimitriou, and looked at the unitary beta ensembles. Right? So, so C beta E. Right? So this, co this corresponds to the measure where the joint distribution of eigenvalues is lambda I minus lambda J product I, I less than J. Now these are on the disk, okay? Uh, on the circle, sorry, to the power of beta with respect to length measure. And you can put the weights, which are Dirichlet, just before, beta over 2. Okay, and so then you have some random measure on the disk, okay, which uh, the eigenvalues are, the locations are distributed like this, the weights are distributed like this, everything else is independent. Then Kilip and Nenchu uh, said that in this case, you can get what the Berblunski coefficients are. Okay, so the last one on the disk is just uniform, on the circle is just uniform, but the others, uh, let's see if I can get this right, so alpha, I think k minus 1, alpha k. Uh, so it, it's, it's first of all, it's rotation invari rotationally invariant. Invariant. So remember, it's some random variable in the, in the unit disk. So, so it's invariant on the rotations. Uh, and secondly, alpha k uh, absolute square. So the uh, has, has, has distribution, which is beta. And let me see, so it's, it's 1, and you have, I think, um, 1 and k, right? Beta over 2k, maybe k plus 1. Okay, uh, I, I may have this right wrong, but I think that, that this is correct. So, so what are these? Okay. Um, these are just, you know, these are just random variables on the disk. Uh, this thing pushes the uh, pushes the beta variable close to zero. Okay. So, so the so what this tells you is that this has variance about this uh, about beta over two. Let's see if I do try. Yeah, yeah, something like k plus 1 over 2k plus 1 over beta. No. Inverse. Inverse, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Did I, is this correct or wrong? Okay. It's 2 over beta times k plus 1. Okay. It's equal. Um, so... So the variance is is, um, is going to zero. Um, so did I do this correctly? No, sorry. I think I have to write n minus k. So the variance is growing. Sorry. Okay, so this is what the alpha k's are. So let's look at what the path is. Okay. So remember, we want to understand this path x plus i t that corresponds to this c beta e ensemble eigenvalues. So the variable click coefficients have this very nice rotational invariant thing. So what are they? So I'll tell you how you how, what it means in this sense. Okay. So so you pick how you can construct this. So it's actually going to be a random walk. Okay? And uh, so the path x plus i t for these unitary ensembles is a random walk. It's made into a piecewise continuous function. And what is the random walk? Well, you just pick a radius according to this distribution. You have to convert it to, to <coughs> hyperbolic length. Right? You look at the, look at the, the uniform uh, this you get the this a circle around you with that radius and you jump to a uniform point of that okay and this is a hyperbolic circle so it's not the not the euclidean circle and then you do it again and then you do it again okay but but the the, the variance of the the radius is actually getting larger as you, as you, as you as you go ahead okay 
So you have a hyperbolic random walk with changing variance. So, um, so why is this interesting? Well, you already see the convergence, right? If you look at the CB dot E, I analyze, then it's actually actually just the the operator that corresponds to the hyperbolic random walk. So you take a limit of the hyperbolic random walk. What do you get? You get a hyperbolic Brownian motion with changing variance. So this root one minus t comes from this changing variance here. Okay. And that actually proves this. I mean, you know, you have to do some tail, tail estimates, but that's it. Okay, so that's the proof. So, so let me tell you a strong version of this of this theorem. Okay. So when you prove you prove that C beta e converges to the sine uh, beta process. Mm-hmm. Yes. The, so so so. Okay. So the theorem and actually so this was okay. So the the, the fact that the eigenvalues converge to the, the process like this that's a result of Kilip and Stoichu. Okay. That's uh, also from. 2006 or so, uh, and but in fact, uh, you know, we now have a convergence of on the operator level, okay. And here is what: so you look at tau n, which is the C beta a operator, right? That we the way we, the one that we constructed up there, and and then you get uh, so you look at tau n, you look at its inverse. So this is a differential operator. Its inverse is going to be an integral kite time of operator with a kernel. Okay. So it's actually going to be Hilbert Schmidt. It's very nice, very nice operator. I can try to do it down to explicitly. And you look at also the, the sine beta operator inverse. Okay. And look at this norm. Okay. And which norm? Actually, you can look at this Hilbert Schmidt norm. Okay. And uh, the theorem is that this is less than or equal to, for large n, um, you know, you know, with high probability, this is less than or equal to uh, 1 over n uh, times n to the epsilon, okay? for all epsilon, when oh, this is squared. Okay, so, so, so in what sense is this? Well, of course, these are two random objects. So we have to sort of put them on the same probability space. So this, sends that this says that there exists a coupling. Okay. So uh, let me tell you how strong this, this uh, theorem is. So that's just one conclusion. So if you look at lambda n of k minus lambda k, okay. So this is the k eigenvalue in the in the index bound by k. So the one to the right of zero will be one, and so on. Right? This is the k eigenvalue in the sine beta process. This is the k eigenvalue in the uh, in the lifted uh, process. Okay. So so you can look at the soup over this. For all k less than or equal to n to the one fourth uh, minus epsilon. Okay, so you look at the maximum distance between n to the one fourth eigenvalues, and this goes to zero in probability in this coupling. Okay, so 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 the so not only you have convergence of the of the spectrum, uh, you have a much much stronger uh, rate of convergence bound. You can go all the way up to n to the one fourth eigenvalues, and even those are going to be close. This is just this is an exercise to get from there to there, just, uh, using the Hilbert-Schmidt norm and lot of large numbers. So there, so for beta equals two, the best results that I knew before was actually a recent result of of Veda. Oh, actually, it was just Joseph Najnudel and 
some co-authors, uh, I don't know, where, where, where they had the same thing for n to the minus, n to the 1, 6. So, so even for beta equals 2, as far as I know, this is, this is, uh, this is very strong. Okay. Yes. What about the joint law of this alpha k? The joint law. Oh, they're independent. Yes, they're independent. I still have another question. Mm -hmm. The alpha k in the in the Schrodinger tau process is not the same alpha. Was there an alpha? No, no, that alpha k is, sorry, there was a bad notation. No, that's just some shift, because this thing is somewhat, so you have to take care of some periodicity issues, so that's why. Okay, so I, I want to do one last piece of math, uh, which, is, which is a computation uh, using the Schrodinger tau process. Okay, so, so what you're really interested in, uh, when we first uh, identified this process, you know, we can prove various things about it, CLTs and law of large numbers, all kinds of things. Gap probabilities, for example, what is the chance that you have a large gap? can prove all those things using this representation. Uh, but the one that we are most interested in is, is whether this corresponds to a beta ensemble. Okay? And if it does, then which beta? So let's try to identify it. Right? So we want to understand the probability that there exist two eigenvalues in 0 epsilon. Right? So remember, in the beta ensemble, this should be epsilon to the square, that's, that's just for the eigenvalues to be there if they're Poisson, and then plus another beta for the repulsion term. Okay. So that's why it should be for beta ensemble. So we just wanted to identify this exponent. Okay. So let's do a computation for this. I'm going to give you an upper bound. Okay. So, 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 what, so how do we compute this? Right? Remember, we run this, we run this carousel, but we rotate extremely slow. We rotate with speed epsilon and see how many times it passes the target point. Okay. So it has to pass the target point by uh, at least twice. Okay. So, so at least I can say that this is the probability that the, the carousel it does a full circle. Right? So if it has to cross the same point twice, it has to do a full circle. And let's see, so, so, but, but, but you know, we're doing a rotation at speed epsilon. How can it do a full circle? Well, let's look at the geometry, right? So we're rotating here uh, about some point at speed epsilon. Um, so really the speed, the average speed should be, uh, uh, the average speed should be 2 pi over epsilon, right? So that we go all the way around, at least 2 pi over epsilon. So that means that, that I have to make up for this rotation by, by epsilon by going far away. Okay. So in fact, uh, you know, I have to, have to get about epsilon close to the boundary so that I get about unit speed. Okay, so if you look at that formula which you have up there, you see the speed up there is 1 minus b squared. Okay. So if I get epsilon close to the boundary, then 1 minus b squared will be about 1 over epsilon. So that will actually compensate for epsilon being small. Is this, is this clear? The rotation speed should go up to, at some point, it should go up to about uh, 1 over epsilon. And that means 1 minus b squared. The, the top thing there is bounded. So the only way that can happen is 1 minus b squared is about epsilon. So, OK. But this, so this, is, this, is, this is, of course, in, in Euclidean distance. So in hyperbolic distance, what does this mean? This means that I am about minus log epsilon away from 0. Mm -hmm. Epsilon close to the boundary is about minus log epsilon away from 0. But this is a Brownian motion that you run until unit time. Okay. So basically, its tails, uh, the distance tails, are uh, like, uh, like the tails of a normal. Okay, the hyperbolicity here doesn't matter. 
So what is this? So it's less than or equal to e to the minus, right? Some constant, which depends on the variance, times uh, the distance, which is log epsilon minus log epsilon squared. So what is this? This is equal to epsilon to the minus c log epsilon. Okay. Or maybe write it like this. So epsilon to the c log epsilon. <laughs> so you compare this to that, right? So for the, for the beta ensembles, the repulsion is 2 plus beta. For the, these ensembles, they're actually beta is infinite in some sense. So it's a, the repulsion is much, much stronger than in the, than in the beta ensembles. So it's a much, much more rig rigid ensemble. Okay. And you can see we did all this for just, by, just with uh, looking at this picture and, and heuristics. Okay. Um, I have seven, I have six minutes? Actually a bit more because it started late, right? All right, so I can finish. I, f I wanted to do another computation. Uh, one more computation. So uh, this actually comes with a story. And because I started with talking about beta ensembles, I think it's kind of appropriate to, to finish this series of lectures with a story about beta ensembles. And um, and the story is about Dyson, who in you know, 1962, this is like the golden era of beta ensembles, Dyson has three fantastic papers. Okay, every single one is, is still important. And one of them is the introduction of beta ensembles. The other one is Dyson's Brownian motion, by the way. Uh, and the third one is about the invariant ensembles. So. Uh, so, so, so what happened in that paper? So, so, so it was known, even Wigner could calculate that the chance that if you have a large gap between two eigenvalues, okay, in, in GOE, for example, is not like a Poisson, right? The Poisson, the chance is exponential in the size of the gap. But, 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 but here, in this case, it's exponential in the square of the size of the gap. And so, so even, even Wigner was aware of this. But, but you know, Dyson was, was much, much more brave. And of course, he's a physicist. But he gave you a formula. Okay? And this is what it looked like. So it's, this is in the scaling that we have. Okay? So gap, gap probably, so it's minus beta square, beta over 64, lambda squared. Okay? <coughs> Plus, so, so lambda squared is the main term. Okay? So again, this is the probability of, of let's say, tau beta or sine beta has no, no eigenvalue in zero lambda, okay? Okay, so let me write it like this. So, so this is what Dyson said. Uh, then there is a linear term, okay? And there is a polynomial term. Okay, and, and Dyson said that this gamma beta is equal to one quarter beta over two plus two over beta plus six. Okay. Uh, yes, so, okay, sorry. So let's put it like this, okay? This, uh, this is when lambda goes to, lambda goes to infinity. In fact, there is a constant here, so, so you can put here a constant plus. So, so, so you know, this is a physics story in some sense. So, so many people say there is a proof, that means they're convinced that it's true and they have very good arguments, right? But various arguments, but, but in physics there's a hierarchy of arguments. That some arguments matter more than some others because they're maybe more rigorous or people give more credit to it. So in 1973, uh, Meta and uh, Cloiseau, actually computed these values for, for just uh, the special betas, beta equals 1, 2, and 4. Okay. They computed this gamma beta with more precise methods. I think they're still physics methods, but they're, they're, they're more precise. And, 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 and figure that this is wrong. Mm -hmm. 
So, so at, at that point, there was no guess. Okay? So <laughs> we knew that it's not that, and, and you know, you could have guessed some formula, but they knew the values for 1, 2, and 4. Okay? So, so using uh, these methods that we have here and SDEs, uh, we actually proved with, with uh, Waco, uh, like Waco that this formula is true, you just have to put a minus 3 here. <laughs> so that's not, that's not a theorem. <laughs> and this is, I don't know, 2010 maybe, something like that. Uh, and so the last thing I want to tell you is how you prove this. Not the gammas, but I'll tell you this. <laughs> so, so the idea is the following. Remember, you have this boundary point, you have this hyperbolic Brownian motion, and this guy is moving around like this. I'm going to see if it makes a full circle. The problem of doing uh, computing with this is that you know, there are a lot of things. It's too much, too much to take track, take, take care of. So you'd like to have some quantity which just evolves by itself, uh, and, and, you know, and you can follow it. You don't have to follow lots of things at the same time. And, th and there is a quantity like that, which is the hyperbolic angle. Okay, so hyperbolic angle between, between this point 1, bt, and, and, and gamma t. Okay, so this angle, so we call this alpha t. And, and you can write, the, write down this hyperbolic angle, and, and it satisfies an SDE. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, it's better to, better to do this in... Uh, I hope I have my SD. <laughs> yes. In, in fact, you see, in the Brownian motion, there is a time-dependent parameter. It's good to scale it out and put it somewhere else. So, so let me do it like this. Okay, so I... So you, so, you, so you write the SDE for alpha in standard time, so not logarithmic time. Okay, it looks like this. So the alpha is lambda, and now there is another function f, which is not the same f as before. Anyway, I just write it like this. Okay, so there is a drift, lambda times f, uh, f, f depends on time, plus um, 2 sine alpha over 2 uh, dB. This is just a standard boundary motion. Okay. And it, uh, it actually turns out that alpha converges uh, to a multiple of 2 pi. And lambda, almost surely. Okay. Uh, st goes to infinity. This this is now an inf this is now on the time scale zero infinity, okay. because of this ch time change. This is actually trivial. This is just a fact about SDs. Okay. Because let's see what happens here, right? So. So this is an SDE on the real line. Right? What's happening? So there's some, some noise term which has some bounded variance, right? This is a sign here. And then there is a drift term. Oh, I didn't tell you what FT is. So F of T is actually just an exponential random variable with, so the density of an exponential random variable with, with, with beta over four uh, parameters. So it over beta over four T. Okay. So it's exponentially decaying this F of T and it depends on beta. So there is a drift whose total integral is, is, is lambda, okay? That's it, it's, it's not much of a drift. And then there is this noise term. So, and also this is, so it's essentially a martingale, okay? Because there's a drift, but, yeah, so, so this, and it's not negative also. It's another interesting thing because it cannot cross down to minus infinity because then when you, when you get to zero, alpha gets to zero, this variance goes to zero. So you will never be able to cross zero, okay? So it's a non-negative martingale, so it has a limit. It's not a martingale because there is a drift, but this drift is, is, has integral, which is finite, so it's essentially a martingale. It's, all of this can be easily proved. So it does have a limit, almost surely, 
And it's also easy to check that the limit can only be uh, an integer multiple of 2 pi, because otherwise there is still some variance here. It will still keep buzzing. Okay? The only way the, the variance disappears, which it has to if it has a limit, is, is if this is a multiple of 2 pi. Okay? And actually, which multiple it is, so that's, that's a theorem. It's just n lambda. So it's the number of eigenvalues uh, in, in the interval. Okay. So, so, so what is, how do you compute this gap probability? Okay, so here is your f. And here is 2 pi. Right, so it could converge here, or it could converge to 0. Right, so it starts at 0, has a positive drift, and it, it buzzes. And we, what we want is that it never reaches 2 pi. Because if it reaches 2 pi, then, then again, uh, the same way, it can go again below 2 pi. Okay? So this alpha, for the same reason, because there's a drift, drift up that can push it through upwards, but downwards, you, it can't go because, because the variance vanishes when it gets to multiples of 2 pi. Okay? So, so what, do, what are we computing? We have a large lambda. Right, because we want to understand the large gap. So we want to understand the number of eigenvalues in a huge thing, and we want it to be zero. Okay? So this Brownian motion, or this SD, which is a gigantic drift, will have to be confined in an interval. Right? So, 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 so you know, how does that happen? Well, the way that happens, of course, it's easy. It, 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 it's more easy for it to change its drift if the variance is large. Okay, right? Uh, if, 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 the, if the variance is small, then of course it will just, if the variance is zero, it will follow this drift no matter what. If, there, if you add some noise term, it can deviate from the drift, and the more variance you add, the more you can deviate. So actually, you can just uh, forget this sign alpha over two, just look at the maximum. So it's gonna probably gonna stay in the middle to, to, to be able to kill off this drift. And how much does it cost to kill off this drift? Well, you know, you know, a change of variables formula for 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 Brownian motion, right? The Brownian motion with drift is absolutely continuous with with the Brownian motion without drift, at least up to finite time. And, and and what's the change of variables formula? Well, the probability that it follows something some some drift that it shouldn't is just exponential to the minus, right? The L two norm of f uh, squared actually lambda f squared, uh, divided by twice the variance. But the variance there is 2, so divided by 8. Okay. Right, that, that's, that's how much it is. That's how, that's how hard it is for this Brownian motion to compensate for a drift so that it don't go out of this, uh, doesn't go out of this trip. Okay. This is just standard facts about Brownian motion. And, uh, and if you compute that, you know, you just get exactly exponential of uh, minus beta over 64 lambda squared. Okay. Uh, and uh, you can get all the way to that gamma if you do this thing more precisely. Okay. Well, quite a bit more precisely. But. Okay, well, thanks very much. It's a pleasure. <laughs>
is 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 a complement to it's, it's complementary to universality even though you can prove universality in certain cases but it's really not the point the point is to to identify the limit and as a probabilistic object that you can say things about uh, using your usual tools okay? not just an analysis okay? so that's that's it's it's more it's more that okay. i mean you know, in the 70s, uh, probability almost died because people were trying to prove various uh, harder and harder versions of the central limit theorem. But fortunately, statistical physics saves it. So let's hope that the same doesn't happen with universality. <laughs> I have a question here. Using this, uh, this sine beta operator, you, you managed to analyze the eigenvalues of the... I mean, you make a connection between the eigenvalues which are close to close to unity, right? The eigenvalues in the circle which are close to unity. Yes. So yes. how about the, the ones in the bulk? Does this, this treat like That's the bulk. It's invariant. Is That's invariant yeah. orientation? Yes. Okay. So there was no... There was no. no. There's nothing, nothing else. <laughs> But but you, you can ask uh, the same thing about GUE, yeah. right? And and in fact, uh, in this carousel paper, we proved that the GUE uh, and and, this and the you know the beta harmita ensembles converge to this in the bulk. But the story is nicer with uh, with the unitaries. That's why it's it's, it's simpler in that case. Yeah, I have a simple question. Uh, does this uh, hyperbolic disk in your talk have some have some relation with the uh, hyperbolic space in Professor Stabo's talk? It's the same hyperbolic space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Are you using the, so the same symmetry? You were using the symmetry or some of the formulas you were using. Uh, yeah. Join some symmetries of this uh, hyperbolic thing. So, so it's possible that you know for for some you could relate some uh, random walk on the line maybe or something to <laughs> it's a reinforced random walk on the line or some weighted line or something to, to this that's possible so there's, there's not a direct uh, physical no i mean you know so 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 <sighs> How should I say? I mean, I mean, random walk is 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 a is a Gaussian fi Gaussian free field on, on the line, right? But, and, and and so in that talk, so so you have a random walk here, which is some version of a Gaussian free field in the line. So you can say that. And in that talk, there are also Gaussian fields in the in the line. So it's and and then also the fields were not exactly Gaussian, but hi but hyperbolic. So so in that sense, again again the case when this 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 operator is aligned, but I think it's not very interesting for reinforced random walk. Then maybe there is some more direct connection. Yeah.